Hey dudes, welcome to Splat from the Past, the only 80s themed horror and sci-fi show where things can get totally radical. Now today, I will be welcoming a guy that a lot of you kids who grew up in the late 80s, early 90s may remember from HBO, Jim Fife. He was the host of Buy Me That, Earth to Kids, he was on the children's sketch comedy learning show, Encyclopedia, and he's also been in horror and sci-fi things such as the short-lived series The Dark Shadows, um, In the Mouth of Badness, and of course, that classic Peter Jackson movie, The Frighteners, and many others, and I'm having him on the show today to talk about all that. He's currently an acting teacher, and I want to find out how he got into teaching acting. Jim Fife has always been such a fascinating character and fascinating guy in the world of entertainment, and he's sadly underrated. So I had to reach out to him and get an interview, and that's what happened. So, uh, yeah, here is my interview with Jim Fife. Hey, Jim. Hi, Tommy. How are you? I am great, sir. How are you? Good. Great. It's such an honor, sir. Thank you for taking the time today. <laughs> my pleasure, really. <laughs> <clears throat> so, going back in time, um, did you gravitate towards acting early on? Yes. Yeah, I was always like the kid putting on shows in my basement and stuff. Uh, when I was in fourth grade, I put on a show in my basement. I was uh, raised Catholic, so I did it to raise money for the missions. And uh, we did, uh, I think we did an episode of F Troop. Yeah. We did uh, an episode of the Fantastic Four. Wow. Uh, we did some various comedy bits, and naturally, I starred in every single one. <laughs> we raised the the princely sum of sixty dollars, <laughs> which in nineteen sixty eight was, I guess, worth about sixty five dollars now. Uh, and uh, <laughs> we donated it to the mission. So yeah, so that was forever. And then in high school, it was just I was in every show I could get near and. It just went on from there. Wow. And did you do um, school plays and community theater and all that? Never did community theater, but I did do, like I said, I did every play that I could, you know, that my school did, I was involved in. Nice. So, and then I majored in it in college. And then got out of college and pretty much started working right away. And where you from originally? South Jersey near Philadelphia. Nice. So did you go to New York uh, for college? Uh, no, I went to Pennsylvania for college, a small, it was a then small school. Uh, it's changed its name. It's, it's now called DeSales University, and it's now the home of the Pennsylvania Shakespeare Company and all that stuff. But at that time, it was just a really small school with a really good theater department. So it was, uh, it was really a great place to be, perfect for me at the time, because I got to be in a million shows and be bad as an actor and learn about <laughs> acting and just, you know, steep myself in it. So, but I also will say, I, I also studied, uh, you know, I had to take history and philosophy and stuff like that. So that was the first time that I was any kind of, uh, academic student as well. I just, I just embraced all of it and it was really great. It was a great experience for me. Did you uh, join an improv group? No, that was after college because I got out of college uh, in 1980 and um, I moved to New York and I was just kind of scrounging around working temp job, like the, the cliche actor experience, you know, just working crappy jobs and living on franks and beans and, uh, just trying to get in any little off off Broadway show, and so eventually, you know, I I kind of started. Um, I th was doing summer stock, and one summer, I put together a stand up act because by about 1983, the stand up thing was really starting to boom. Like stand up was just suddenly everywhere. Yeah, and I thought I you know I really want to try this so. I started doing stand-up, and I started kind of getting work as an actor right around the same time. And as 
part of doing stand-up, that's when uh, a guy approached me about one of the clubs where I did stand-up. This guy was putting together a, an improv group. His name, his name actually is Peter Spellos, and he will be known mm. to fans of the Transformer cartoon from the 80s because he did the voice of one of the characters on that. And he's done a million B-movies, Peter Spellos. And uh, so he started this improv group, and that was my introduction to improv, which wow. I now teach. So um, so I, it, I, you know, kind of all, I was just doing everything at the same time. Improv, stand-up, straight-up acting, all everything all at once because I was just so... You know, I was into it 120 percent. Yeah, I, I've been doing stand up 13 years, and I know a lot. Wow. Of, I know a lot of the old guys. I've interviewed a lot of them and stuff. So, did you go to like Catch a Rising Star? Uh, I went to Catch, but Peter had a small, small, small club called Who's on First. It's a tiny little room on 65th Street and First Avenue, down the street from Danger Fields. Oh yeah, and uh, it was just a tiny room. And so, you know, he was such a warm guy and an embracing guy. But John Stewart got his start there. There were lots of people who worked there. And um, for me, this also was right at the time that I started doing my first Broadway show. So I was always an actor who did stand up rather than a stand up who was an actor. Yeah. So, I would do like my Broadway thing and then I would go do stand up after that. And so I wasn't particularly, I did audition, did I, I auditioned to catch, I, I worked at, definitely passed at the comic strip um, and I emceed there a lot, I appeared there a bunch, you know, but my stand up thing was always kind of secondary to my acting thing, which was going pretty strong in those days. Mm hmm. And who were some of the other comedians that were there at that time? Uh, when I was at the comic strip, um, uh, well, at Who's and the comic strip, a big friend of mine was a guy named Scott Carter, who stopped doing stand-up, but who is a legend in the business as the producer of and co-creator of Politically Incorrect and Real Time with Bill Maher. He produced, he's been executive producer of both of those shows. And he's a close friend of mine. So he's he was around that scene. But also around that scene, the younger guys were Adam Sandler, Chris <laughs> Rock, um, and then a bunch of people that I was with who dropped out. <laughs> <laughs> but there was also guys like uh, like Seinfeld and Dom Irera and um... Right. Dom Irera was still around, but by the time I was doing this, Seinfeld had already, I think, moved to LA. Mm -hmm. So, so it, it, you know, I think I missed them by like a year or two. But Dom Irera, God, oh. that guy was just great. He was just awesome. I remember seeing Larry David do stand up too, and that was just like, wow. Yeah, <laughs> it was many levels above me. Yeah, Dom still is brilliant. Um, how about uh, did you ever see Ileana Douglas when she did stand up? No, I never did. I didn't know she had done stand up. Yeah, she only did it for like a year. And um, also, Susie Essman was there at that time. Susie, I know well. Absolutely. Yep, I know Susie. She's brilliant. Yeah. Yeah, she is great. She's great. Awesome. Okay, so did that lead to you doing your um, one-man show, A Normal Guy? Yes, because my stand-up was, you know, was an actor's stand-up. So I had, I had riffs, you know, about my family. I had some kind of, you know pretty typical, you know, observational stuff, but I also had characters, and, you know, the people that I admired in stand-up, really, my great hero of stand-up is Richard Pryor. Oh, yeah. Pryor was a great actor, aside from everything else, and his first stand-up film was what inspired me to do stand-up, when he did his heart attack, mm -hmm. <laughs> that was to me, the pinnacle, that was it, because it was literally painfully funny. And yet he was also completely committed to it as an actor. And so I thought that is what I want to do. And so, yeah, I did like, you know, the stand-up thing, but doing characters and clubs, eh, you know, wasn't really working, you know, with people drinking gin and tonics, you know. So uh, 
so I took kind of all my character stuff and put it into one evening, and that was a normal guy. Wow. Yeah, I, I watched the uh, performance of it that aired on local television. It was on YouTube. I saw it. Yes. I saw it yesterday. It was funny. I like your opening line. I'm Jim Fife and, tick, and chicks dig me. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. Yeah, uh, the director of that show put that on YouTube, and I didn't. He didn't tell me, you know. So there it is. Like, yeah, it's really amazing to, geez, look back at my, see myself strutting around in 1987. It's like, wow, a lot of feelings. Yeah, it was really funny. I liked it. Thank you. Sure thing. According to IMDb, your acting career really started off with a bang when you got to work with Robert Altman on Tanner 88. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, I, uh, what, what I discovered is, you know, I got, an, I got an understudy gig in this Neil Simon play, Biloxi Blues, on Broadway. So I was the understudy with the original cast. The other understudy was Woody Harrelson. And um, so, you know, he very quickly left for bigger things. Yeah. And I stayed with it. I ended up taking over the role, and I was in the show. So all told, that whole gig was like almost two years. And it just put me on a different level where I was suddenly able to be seen for like TV stuff and movie stuff. So one of the things that happened during that time was, uh, or right after that time, was Tanner 88 working with Robert Altman. By the way, I don't know if you've seen the Martin Scorsese documentary about the Rolling Thunder review on Netflix, Bob Dylan. Oh, uh, oh, yeah, I saw Don't Look Back, the documentary. Right, no, but this is on Netflix now, and it's a documentary Scorsese just did oh, about yeah. the Rolling Thunder review. The only reason right. I bring it up is, smack in the middle of that, Jack Tanner, the character from Tanner 88, appears, which was my first clue that this, documentary that Scorsese makes is making is kind of fake. He, it, he has all kinds of fake stuff in there. So there's Michael Murphy being Jack Tanner in the middle of this thing in Netflix in 2019. So yes, this project Tanner 88 was like really cool because it was the first thing to blend the real politicians and, you know, actors. Yeah. Uh, and we followed the, pro the primary process. In other words, we shot the first episode in New Hampshire two weeks before the primary, and then it aired, I think, the Monday night before the primary. Then we went to Atlanta for Super Tuesday. So it was incredible. It was incredible. I got to work with some amazing people, Altman, Cynthia Nixon, um, Michael Murphy, who played Jack Tanner, uh, Pamela Reed, incredible cast, and Altman, who just loved actors and let everybody kind of improvise in front of the camera. It was extraordinary. It's an amazing experience. Yeah, I heard he was very generous when it came to improv on the yeah. sets. I have a friend who had a tiny part in the movie. She played a girl in a, in a swimming pool. <laughs> uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah, her, name, her name's Cynthia Levin, very funny stand-up comedian in L.A. That's cool. Yeah, it was really a great thing. And, you know, it was also my introduction to politics. Mm -hmm. You know, we ended up at the 1988 Democratic Convention shooting on the floor of the convention without a permit. Wow. And uh, <laughs> it, was, it was really cool. And I've been, you know, fascinated by politics ever since then. Nice, nice. Now, throughout my elementary school years, I watched Encyclopedia on HBO every morning before school. I This was such an original idea for a show because right. I haven't seen a children's sketch comedy show since. How did this show come about for you? Uh, it was literally at the same time that I was making Tanner 88. So I had a bounce back and forth from shooting Tanner 88 and shooting Encyclopedia. And Encyclopedia was put together as co-production of HBO yeah. and Children's Television Workshop, which does Sesame Street. So the budget was huge. And, um, you know, every day we would come in and there would be two or three massive new sets. And we would do these crazy sketches. It was really fun. It, it, it could have and should have 
had a life beyond that. I think, you know, it happened during the writer's strike. Yeah. So that may have been a problem. I don't know. But certainly the cast was really strong. Great people. A uh, great creative team. And, you know, I wish it had had a life, you know. But uh, it, through the magic of the Internet, it lives on. Yeah. Well, uh, it reminded me of like a cross between kids, uh, the kids in the hall meets those PBS morning kids shows. Yeah. What, what, what was like the writing process? Did they like, you know, pick uh, family friendly topics and then just make a sketch out of it? I wasn't involved in the writing, you know, um, so I don't really know. I know that they had basically like they were Sesame Street writers. Right. And I think the Sesame Street writers were wanting to write uh, something a little you know, um, a little longer, a little more complicated, a little funnier in, in a certain way, you know, for, you know, like kind of like Electric Company had been a step up from um, uh, from Sesame Street. This was, I think, another avenue of a step up, you know, in terms of older kids or whatever. Mm-hmm. Maybe also in that time, you know, HBO wasn't as big as it is now. And also, I don't know what other children's programming HBO had. I do know that one of the produ- the producer for HBO is the now legendary Sheila Evans, right? Who went on to create their documentary division and just blow that up. So she was the producer of the show. You know, she's a dynamo. So anyway, all the pieces were there. It just didn't, you know, didn't go on as many things. Do not. I know. It's, it seems like it lasted a long time, even though it didn't. Um, two sketches I loved the most that you were in was the one where uh, uh, you were playing the hunchback in the uh, Frankenstein brain one. Yeah, yeah. That was hilarious. And um, the one where um, you're trying to propose to, to your girlfriend and there's a Venus flytrap at the table. <laughs> remember the Igor sketches yeah because the thing about me is how easy it is to make me into Igor um you know it's not that far a cry from Igor to Willie Lo- Loomis on Dark Shadows uh you know I'm never the guy they think of to call in when they're looking for a new James Bond you know <laughs> so um and later on on the TV show of Honey I Shrunk the Kids I literally played Igor again <laughs> like same part, different show. Wow, that's that's so funny. Are are you still in touch with anyone in the cast? The cast of of Encyclopedia. Yeah. yeah, I would say the only person from that that I'm re- that I'm in any kind of touch with is um, Carol Schindler, who I see once every year or so. Uh, she was very talented. She's amazing. You know, she was up for. Saturday Night Live a bunch of times. Wow. And uh, just never got it, you know, all that stuff. But yeah, a, 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 a great talent. Yeah, David Sterry, he was hilarious. He should have been bigger than he yeah. was. He's, uh, he's become a book doctor. If you, I think if you Google thebookdoctors.com, you're mm-hmm. going to get something related to David Sterry. Nice. Faith Prince, she's like the most successful out of everyone right. next to you. Right. Once in a great while, once every 10 years, I bumped into her. And of course, Ethel died. Yes. That was yeah. sad. Yeah. Uh, however, I did get to know Ethel. Not super, super well, but well enough to have a lot of respect for, for them. Uh, and mm-hmm. the decision that they made based on, you know, that period, you know, with AIDS and everything, the decision, you know, that they made, uh, that seemed perfectly in character for Ethel. You know, Ethel yeah. was going to be in, t- in control of their life, you know? Yeah. I-, I found out the musical group Betty is still around. Yes, I heard that too. I heard that too, yeah. They had a hard job, though. They had to write a song every episode, you know, for something. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So, so did that show lead to you hosting Buy Me That and Earth to Kids? Absolutely, directly led to that. Yes, Sheila Evans again. She liked me, so there I was, telling children what to do. 
<laughs> that show, you know, really holds up because, you know, we live in an era now where just people buy things they don't need. And I think the show has uh, a positive message to it. Thanks. I think so, too. You know, I mean, I'm obviously I'm not an actor anymore, mm-hmm. but uh, I'm happy that, you know, the successes I did have were I was never in anything I felt like I had to apologize for. It was like, you know, extremely violent or exploitative of women or, you know, I mean, except I wasn't a show about vampires, but, you know, that's kind of a judgment call. Yeah. <laughs> did you did you know that um, IMDB incorrect incorrectly says that you were in Ghostbusters 2? <laughs> I did not know that. Um, it would be great if I incorrectly got, uh, uh, you know, some royalties from that. But uh, no, I didn't. I wasn't aware of that. Yeah, I've, kn- I've known about that for years. And just recently I was I was uh, corrected as to why. They think you were in it. The the guy who plays the Central Park jogger ghost and one of the Scolari brothers is a guy by the name of Jim Fi. Oh wow! Look at that. How about that? Yeah. And so he's been booked for like comic cons and stuff, and so I, I finally solved the mystery on that one. <laughs> right. Right. That's interesting. Very interesting. So then you were on the short-lived horror series Dark Shadows. Right. And did you move to L.A. for that? Uh, well, we, you know, we lived, we stayed in L.A., you know, um, for, what was it, three months while we made that. And uh, that was just, that was just another great experience. You know, it was just so fun. Uh, I already knew Joanna going from New York. Mm-hmm. And uh, so that was cool. And working with Roy Thinnes. Because I grew up on the Invaders and Gene Simmons, because I was like a huge fan of, um, you know, she's Ophelia in Lawrence Olivier's film of Hamlet. Of course, in Spartacus, which is one of my favorite movies. Uh-huh. So it was, and again, like Robert Altman, Dan Curtis just kind of let me go. He just sort of let me do what I wanted to do, which was fantastic. Mm-hmm. Uh, do you have any uh, good stories about Barbara Steele? Barbara Steele. No, she's a very smart woman, a pleasure to work with. We always got along just great. We weren't like, you know, close friends or anything, but no, I don't really have any stories about Barbara Steele. How about Ben Cross? Oh, Ben. Ben is great. Great guy. Now, he is a guy that they call when they need a new James Bond, or he was. Mm-hmm. He auditioned for to replace Pierce Brosnan, I think. Or he auditioned, and it was going to be him or Pierce Brosnan, stuff like that. But Ben is a cockney. Mm-hmm. He's actually an East Ender. And, he, you know, he has the, the you know, the cheekbones of a, an aristocrat. And he got the, you know, posh accent from drama school. So he could kind of, you know, act that part, you know, Barnabas and all that other roles he played. But, he, his real personality is he's he's a he's a cockney, he's like a you know he's like a, a working class guy. He's a lot of a lot of fun. We 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 had a blast on that show. He's a really great guy. Uh, that's great. So were you guys up against another hit show that led to its cancellation? Uh, yes, we were up against a hit show called the First Iraq War, which uh, <laughs> which happened the day that we premiered, or the week after we premiered, um, the United States started bombing Baghdad. Oh, boy. So it was like, you know, uh, it's, you know, there's a lot of reasons why I think that show didn't, Dark Shadows didn't make it, but I mean, we were up against world events, so that was certainly a big factor. (laughs) Oh, that's terrible. And that was also the time of the Gulf War. It just ended, right? No, the, the Gulf, that's what we're talking about, the Gulf War. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we were bombing Baghdad and like, you know, uh, my wife was pregnant with my daughter at the time and, you know, it just, it looked like, you know, it looked like, it, it looked from the, from the beginning like it wasn't going to be having much life afterwards, you know. And 
that's a shame because in a, in a second season they could have gone, you know, they could have gone in a different or or you know newer directions. They they were very dedicated to kind of taking care of the um, you know the fans of the original show, but I think that that they you know my feeling is they could have gone um, further, you know, with everything. It was exactly the era of Twin Peaks. And there was a great, you know, it was time for television to start doing new, new things. And with Twin Peaks and a few other shows that were out at that time, you could see that there were certain people who were pushing it. And Dark Shadows had a big budget. It had a great cast. You know, it had some very good creative people. They could have, if they'd just gone, I think, a little further, the show might have had, you know, a bit more life. That's just my take on it. Yeah. And then uh, you, you were in the remake of A Kiss Before Dying? I was, yeah, my first movie. Yeah, yeah. That was an intense experience. Yeah, and Matt Dillon and the always unique Sean Young. I mean, that had Matt, to... Yeah, Matt Dillon was great. Sean Young, I got to admit, uh, just, again, like, I don't know if it was me mm-hmm. or and my reaction to her or how she was or whatever, but she just, you know, I spent very little time with her, but she managed to completely freak me out. <laughs> she's got that ability from what I've been told. <laughs> yeah. yeah, she's very unique. And so, you did a um, TV movie of uh, Alien Nation called Dark Horizon. Oh, that's right. Yeah, you got yep. to work with Kenneth Johnson, who's like the master of sci-fi at that time. Mm-hmm. I now look, you know, when you're a, a character actor like me, I, I'm positive that that was. I think it was maybe, you know, a morning or afternoon of my life. It was. I, I was in one scene. I remember I was handcuffed to a chair, and I was basically playing like some greasy low-life scum was scared of aliens that's actually a show that's like talk about the message of a show being ahead of its time um but anyway uh you know i i i you know i remember shooting the scene but that's about all i remember yeah <clears throat> i just i just wanted to ask because i love uh, i love horror and sci-fi and i wanted to ask about the horror and sci-fi rules sure sure, sure. yeah of course you played uh, you played a bookstore fan in John Carpenter's In the Mouth of Madness. I did? Yeah. I did not. Okay, then that's just an IMDb flubber again. <laughs> Jeez, it must be that other dude, Jim Fye. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, well. Uh, you played uh, Stewart in The Frighteners. That's right, yeah. And, like, you know, I hate to sound like a broken record, but another terrific experience. I got to go to New Zealand for 10 weeks work with Peter Jackson and his crew, uh, worked with Michael Fox, Trini Alvarado, Shy McBride and I. Shy is one of the funniest. Have you ever interviewed him? No, I haven't yet. He is a great guy. He's hilarious. We had a blast and my wife and my daughter came with me and my wife, uh, she's actually my late wife, is in that film. Do you know that film well? The other Frighteners, I've seen it. Yeah. I've seen it a couple times. Okay, so the scene where the babies start to float, mm-hmm. right? There's right. a maid in it who screams, that is my late wife. Nice. Yeah, yeah. Was that, that, was that before she passed, just before? Oh, no, it was many years before. She passed in 2006. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah, we were down there, and, you know, the only reason I bring it up is it shows, like, Peter Jackson's like has his crew of guys, you know, people, guys and girls and men and women who work on this, you know, um, you know, work on stuff with him. And he, it was just a, a family feeling, very friendly. When I saw The Hobbit or when I saw the Lord of the Rings movie, I was like, oh, of course, Peter Jackson made this. Him and his buddies, they are hobbits. I mean, they are literally friendly, hairy guys who walk around barefoot when it's like 38 degrees out. Like, they're great guys. And it was just a really a total pleasure to go down there. It's such a beautiful place, and it was uh, really fun. And another 
film where, geez, you know, if that thing had been released at Halloween when it was originally supposed to, mm -hmm. or who knows, you know, I think it's had a greater life since its release than during the time it was released. Yeah, and Michael J. Fox, I mean, I've heard from everybody, just he's a total sweetheart. Yeah, he is. He's a great guy. Did you have any interaction with Dee Wallace? No, no. I think she was there when I was not. Yeah, she's been on the podcast twice. She's also a sweetheart. Cool, good. Yeah. Uh, Peter Jackson, though, I mean, uh, w working with him, this was a few years before he started doing the Lords of the Rings movies. Uh, did you did you have any idea that he would win the Academy Award years later? It doesn't surprise me because, you know, the guy is such a film fan. I remember being at his house and he showed me one of the claymation figures from the original uh, King Kong. Mm -hmm. You know, he was into that, he was into the Beatles. You know, and Fran Walsh, who's his partner, you know, was into true crime. And you could see where the Frighteners came from. And even though, you know, they were kind of couldn't, couldn't quite make it all gel into one thing, you just knew these are intensively creative, intensely creative people. And, you know, when I saw the, I got invited to the opening of Lord of the Rings in New York, and it was just like, just thrilling, and, and like I say, it made perfect sense that this guy and his team had made that movie, and I was just so proud of them and excited, so no, I wasn't really surprised. I was pleased, though, very pleased. Yeah, and I heard that um, that King Kong remake he did, yeah, I heard it was like years of planning. He'd always wanted to do a remake of King Kong. I think he did, and I think it was also like, if I don't do it, they'll give it to somebody with less talent than me. Right. going to do it. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So I thought the King Kong remake was really good. I liked it. It was good. Yeah, I think it was. Did, uh, do you get recognized for the Frighteners the most? No. I think the thing I get recognized for the most is the um, Buy Me That specials. Because so many people see them in school. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah. Um, but that doesn't happen that often, really. I mean, you know, I don't live in New York City anymore, so, you know, I, and, and I'm older. So, uh, I mean, it happens once in a great, great while. I get more, like, people Ooh. kind of squinting at me and going, like, do I know you? That kind of thing. Yeah. <laughs> so what made you decide that you were going to uh, go into teaching into it. Um, I moved to L.A. in 94, mm -hmm. and um, I, you know, I, we lived out there for eight years? Yeah, eight years? No, sorry, we went in 93, and we came back in 2001 to the East Coast. And although I worked in L.A., just, you know, the scene in L.A., just sort of, I found it depressing. Um, I, you know, I got more and more work as each year went by, but I found it less and less satisfying or interesting. So I supported my family, but it was like, you know, I don't really feel like I'm accomplishing anything creatively, and financially, it wasn't like I broke through and became a regular on a hit series that, you know, because, mm -hmm. you know, either, you know, I guess for, to be an actor, it's such a weird and demanding thing. If you're not feeling it creatively and or making big piles of money, it doesn't really make much sense as a life. At least it didn't for me. But, uh, so really just like, you know, the feeling just sort of died out. You know, the, the guy I was in the 80s where I was just like going, going, going all the time, it, it just didn't, you know, L.A., in L.A., I felt like I was cast according to what I looked like by somebody who glanced at me mm -hmm. for three seconds, and that was it. And so it didn't feel creative. It wasn't financially so great that I couldn't turn it away. I just didn't know what next. So... I kind of started um, substitute teaching uh, 
uh, when I lived in LA, like between gigs. And, um, but I kept working as an actor. And then my friend Scott Carter, who now produces Bill Maher, um, was producing Bill Maher then, but as a side project, he did a show on Oxygen, mm -hmm. Candace Bergen, and he hired me to write for that. So I wrote on that show for a season, and that was like, oh, hey, I could be a writer, you know, or a producer in TV. So uh, I, I kind of tried that avenue for a while, and then we moved back in 2001 because we didn't really love L.A. We were eating, my late wife and I are both East Coast people. Mm -hmm. So we, you know, wanted to come back. My daughter was about to, I just turned 10, and we didn't want her to go to middle school in L.A. So we came back East, and I thought I had some prospects as a producer in TV, and none of them worked out. So I ended up kind of backing into teaching that way. But um, once I got, own classroom and started teaching history, a subject in which I don't have a degree, it's just my hobby. Um, once I had my own classroom, I suddenly felt like, oh, you know, this really feels right for me. And so that was 2002, 2003. And so, you know, that gradually, you know, I was still auditioning a little bit for commercials, but I kind of let it go and just became a full-time teacher found it more rewarding and also I was able to be with my family on a regular basis and know where you know our next paycheck was coming from yeah that's the unfortunate part that uh, a doctor hits a certain point in their career when uh, the roles dry up and you know they start getting repetitive and then they they go into teaching or they pick up a trade or something yeah you you know you can like I say yeah for me it was just like the feeling died before my career died. The career was actually going better and better every year in L.A., but it wasn't breaking through to a new level, either creatively or financially. And I thought, can I keep going on this level for the rest of my life? And the answer was a, a resounding no. And I certainly find the work that I do now much more meaningful than, you know, a lot of the work that I did when I was in LA, I did do some things I was proud of, but you know, um, I, I prefer what I do now. And you know, so uh, yeah, I just find it more meaningful. Mm -hmm. You get you get a um, satisfaction with teaching that you didn't get with acting. Yeah, I do. I do. I mean, you know, I would act again if somebody offered me something, but. Um, but I'm not going to pursue it. It wasn't even the work itself. It's just the, the constant pursuit of it and the constant rejection. My daughter is now an actor in Los Angeles, and it's like, you know, I've lectured her <laughs> many times on the folly of this choice. But unlike me, she is making a choice with a full knowledge of what this life entails, you know, and what she can expect. Yeah. So, you know, if you're making a conscious choice, that a deliberate, you know, uh, an informed choice, that's okay. You know, that's everybody's right. Mm -hmm. For me, I do, I do. You know, I I teach in a school now. I teach in an international school. I teach theater and history. I also teach an improv class, and I coach people for TED talks and stuff like that. So I find that that's all kind of teaching, coaching, guiding people, helping them to learn, helping them to express themselves. And I find that much more meaningful at this phase in my life than, you know, being out there saying, pick me, pick me, pick me. For those of my cohort, you know, people that I came up with who hung in there and are still doing it, I have massive respect. Yeah. You know, it wasn't for me anymore. But you did some really great work that holds up. Thank you. My pleasure. So, uh, do, do you have anything, uh, like your classes or something, you'd like to plug? Well, it's all there on my website, which is jimfife.com. So, it's J-I-M-F-Y-F-E.com. And that'll, that'll give you a decent window into what it is I do now, if anybody wants to check it out. Well, Jim, you are truly blessed and you're truly inspirational, and I appreciate your time today. Well, thanks a lot. Thank you so much. And, uh... 
I hope I gave you something that's uh, useful. Oh, you did, Jim. Thank you so much. And, you know, best of luck to, you know, for the years to come in your teaching and have yourself a great rest of your day. Thanks, you too. And uh, keep breaking a leg out there on the stand-up stage. <laughs> I will try. Thanks, Jim. Have a good day. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Well, there you have it. Jim Fife. Ain't he a cool dude? Uh, I just love hearing stories about per about perseverance. I mean, that was a word that's been around for years. I didn't know what it meant until just recently, and it's a word that I love a lot. And Jim has really persevered, and he's inspiring, and I just love having guests like that who have such a positive attitude. Um, if you like this video, everyone, please subscribe to my YouTube channel. Add me as a friend on Facebook. Join my Tommy Kovac Comedian page on Facebook. Follow me on Twitter and Instagram and all that fun stuff. Well, that's all the time we have this week on Splat from the Past. Until next time, this is Tommy Throwback Kovac saying, there's no shame in living in the past because the present sucks. Later, dudes.